All right. Hello, everybody. Good morning. You are tuned into Eyes on Africa, and I'm your host, Hermela Aragawi. This morning, I'll also be joined by my co-host for the day, Karanja Gashesha. He'll be joining me in just a minute. But while we're waiting, today's a really big day. Uh, the South Africa peace talks between the Ethiopian government and some representatives from the TPLF uh, is supposed to be underway today, although we've got some updates that I'll be able to share with you. But in the meantime, please take a moment to subscribe and share uh, with others that you know will be interested in this conversation. We have multiple guests today that will be giving us their analysis and take from several angles. Of course, Karanja has uh, his own particular angle as a Kenyan uh, American uh, journalist. We know that Uhuru Kenyatta, the former president of Kenya, is a part of the peace talks and it's been some interesting developments uh, with him in the mix. We'll also have attorney Dereja Demise. Uh, they'll be able to join us and give us some uh, legal implications uh, analysis, as well as Graham Peebles, uh, who's based in the UK, a writer based in the UK, who's written about um, the TPLF and knows the TPLF very well as someone who's lived in Ethiopia. So we'll get his take there. So please make sure you are hitting subscribe. I am noticing that a lot of people watch and then they don't actually hit the subscribe button. I do the same thing. So look at your YouTube app and see if that subscribe is uh, dull or if it's still bold and waiting for you to click on it. And make sure you send this directly to some friends so that they can watch this live and interact. Uh, we are going to take comments and questions. I know that people have a lot of uh, questions about how this is going to play out, what we can expect. And I think it's important to consider every uh, realistic alternative um, and maybe those that we don't like so much in order to really be able to be prepared uh, for what's to come. And so I've got my uh, uh, partner, AZ King, that will manage a lot of the uh, comments. Uh, so just please be respectful, but feel free to have uh, the conversations about what's being talked about. Put your comments and questions in there. And so with that said, I'm going to bring in my uh, co-host, Karanja. And then we'll bring in our guests in just a bit. So let's do that. Karanja, welcome. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. An exciting day, Hamela, for a number of reasons. Um, of course, uh, the Uhuru factor is always the wild card, which is always fun to talk about. Um, but also advances made by the ENDF uh, today, right? So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, other, uh, our other guests might know about that, because obviously it's uh, the information is really quickly rolling. Um, but I have gotten, I have seen uh, people saying that ENDF is in Makele. And so um, I, I don't know if you've been able to confirm that, but I'm really, really looking forward to hearing about that. And of course, you, one can't help thinking that uh, the stalls, the stalled uh, peace talks, quote unquote, um, it, it's, it's inevitable that we are going to speculate uh, how the, the, the peace talks being stalled and the ENDF making it to Makele, uh, how those two tie into each other. So very interesting uh, day. I'm looking forward. Absolutely. So the last time that we uh, touched on this conversation, I'm trying to look back and uh, look at our interview and see when that date was. It looks like it was 12 days ago. When we talked about, you know, what exactly is going on, Uhuru Kenyatta pulls out of the scheduled peace talks in South Africa last minute. What is this about? Is this, does this actually favor the TPLF or does this favor the Ethiopian government? And the speculation based on not necessarily the intention, but what we thought may be the result is that it, it, it is giving the Ethiopian government time uh, in the military defensive, essentially, but the kind of turn offensive in terms of um, how well that they're doing. And oh boy, how, what a difference 12 days can what make. difference is, 12 days makes. This is a completely so, different uh, leverage point, I think the Ethiopian government is going into these talks with than they would have if they happened 12 days ago. So 12 days later, do you think that perspective that maybe just maybe Uhuru Kenyatta is um, not didn't cancel the peace talks because he wanted it to favor the TPLF um, 
is that more true now for you than it was even then? More true certainly now than it was then. Uh, the other thing that was uh, that has become apparent since then is that it was not uh, random. It was no. I mean, we we said at the time that it wasn't a random ca uh, cancellation, right? But you know, the, the way these two guys operate, Uhuru and Ruto, is so interesting and so intriguing. I think they have to enjoy the intrigue that they serve to the public because even the news media didn't know what to make of it. And because there's all these memes and stories about Uhuru just being, you know, this guy who just likes to chill and hang out with his Johnny Walker, <laughs> you know, it was very easy. <laughs> <laughs> right. It was it was very easy, at least in Kenyan media, to kind of just dismiss it as, oh, you know, the guy had a hangover. But what really emerged from that is that it appeared the AU um, or whoever was organizing the, the peace talks behind the AU, whoever was pulling the, the, the strings, wasn't particularly organized and hadn't particularly planned this very well, right? And so Uhuru steps in, this guy who people kind of just write off and demands to know what the parameters are. What are the, you know, what are, what are, what, what are the modulations of, I forget the, 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 the verb. The structure age. and modalities is I think modalities, the word. Modalities, exactly. And, um, and then a, a, a few days later, I read that the AU was actually not very organized about how they had organized this. And so what it appears is that he was demanding that the AU need to, to give uh, parameters around uh, these peace talks. What, is, uh, what, are, what are the parameters? What is meant to be achieved? What, and presumably, what is expected of the um, TPLF and uh, what and presumably what is expected of the Ethiopian government. And what we see is that in that time, whether by intention or by default, uh, the Ethiopian government gets to have been very actively pursuing its military objectives. And, um, and by the way, not just military objectives, but they've been very busy with the PR, making sure that every uh, town that they are liberating, uh, they are being seen to be distributing food and taking care of the uh, Ethiopian people uh, yeah. in, in, in these places. So, I mean, I'm really proud of all involved, um, whether it's, uh, you know, Uhuru, um, Abiy Ahmed, Ruto, I'm, I'm just proud to be watching uh, African politics kind of playing out and 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 for once feeling a certain amount of jubilation and success like they 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 seem to have outsmarted whoever it is that right behind this conflict it's very exciting right it's it's no longer you know it's just not very obvious on the surface what they're actually doing and you know you're expecting in some ways for the leaders to throw each other under the bus or to, you know, favor, to make moves that favor the West and, you know, to walk into things they don't understand, like the African Union peace talks. I mean, it makes sense that Uhuru Kenyatta asks for structure and, and objectives as far as what the peace talks were about, because the energy from the West is we need to have peace talks, we need to have peace talks, cessation of hostilities, but this is the third offensive that the TPLF has made. And so it's a very good question to ask, what are we trying to do here? Like, what is the objective with bringing them to the table? Because we've tried to do this before and it ends up with the TPLF going on an offensive into the Amhara and Afar regions, where in some cases it's civilians that are uh, targeted because the soldiers can't be everywhere. Um, and so that's where the people's frustration comes from. I mean, there is, a limitation on the part of the Ethiopian National Defense Forces, meaning they can't be everywhere in this whole huge country of 120 million. And so when, you know, I think for the average person, when any civilian starts to get targeted and for the third time, the tolerance just really drops. And so I think that is why we saw 
over the weekend, massive crowds out in the streets saying to the West, respect our sovereignty. TPLF is the cause. The people of Tigray are our people. It's TPLF who is the enemy of Ethiopia. Um, and so there is, yeah, there's a lot, I think, to the Ethiopian government has learned. I've talked to some uh, sources who, who say, yes, we have learned a lot about how they operate, how the TPLF and its, its, its operatives in the diaspora operate. And so we are uh, giving instructions for our people on the ground to be as careful as possible to take uh, to use the most patience and the most uh, care in how they communicate to the public and letting them know that we are your government, you are our people, we are not here to hurt you, we're here to make sure you get your basic needs met. And I think on the part of the people too, there may be a change. Um, in the beginning, two years ago, they were told you're, these are your enemies that are coming in and were basically told you everything you can to fight them back, whether they actually had arms or not. And so that is the, the energy that the Ethiopian National Defense Forces and Allied Forces were going into that region with. And the attack on the Northern Command, from what I understand, was particularly brutal. So people were coming in with that um in in their head and the adrenaline of the sudden uh start of the war so um you know i have no doubt that some of the atrocities uh that are alleged are 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 real um because that is the nature of war and the nature of this war um was particularly provocative right so this time around it's two years later the government knows what it's up against the people know what they're up against um uh on this on the ethiopian government side and as well as the the people on the ground i think may have had a certain experience with the tplf that would make them think twice so um a lot of things to consider here i do want to announce i was just able to confirm that these peace talks have been moved to Tuesday. It's almost five o'clock in the afternoon and evening in South Africa. So the business day is essentially over. So the peace talks between the Ethiopian government and representatives from the TPLF have been moved uh, to Tuesday. Now, it could just be that people arrive late uh, or they didn't arrive early enough. But again, what we're looking at is another delay in peace talks. What do you make of that, Karanja? Because it could all be different 24 hours from now. <laughs> they could, right? Um, so I did reach out to uh, somebody with um, in, from inside the government, uh, a source in Nairobi, and he's telling me that he has seen a request come in for Uhuru's participation but uh, no confirmation yet about where he is or, or what he's doing. <laughs> so can't even confirm whether he's on a plane or he's in South Africa or he's, um, you know, hanging out on his farm. <laughs> that is in so interesting. You know, I, I was going to say to you, I didn't see anything about Uhuru arriving. Right. But uh, apparently the request has come in um and no confirmation one way or another okay. but uh to your point about the ethiopian army not being able to be everywhere <laughs> it's it's interesting that if the ethiopian army the, the the massive ethiopian army can't be everywhere isn't it interesting then that to hear tplf apologists talk about uh, the eritrean involvement in, um, in in the conflict, you really would think that the Eritrean uh, military are all over Ethiopia. Somehow Eritrea, Ethiopia can't, but somehow Eritrea is able to just have their soldiers all over the place, you know, with, with, with its whole entire 4 million population, like, <laughs> You know, so so that's an interesting factor. And I saw somebody point out that um, part of the strategy here is because Eritrea is already enemy number one of the West. It's very easy to scapegoat and to sort of, you know, have this red herring of, uh, you know, of, 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 a, of a scapegoat to point to and, and sort of find an excuse to extend the conflict, right? These foreign forces, these foreign uh, Eritrean mm -hmm. forces who, by the way, have been invited by the, by the Ethiopian government um, <laughs> uh, are the problem now. 
and um, you know, so 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 interesting moving parts all around. But um, I can't help thinking that the peace talks moving to tomorrow. Of course, I mean, I would imagine the Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed is a little busy with uh, trying to coordinate and make sure that whatever is happening in Makela, if indeed, uh, and I don't know if you've managed to get any confirmation that the ENDF is indeed inside Makele, but um, I've, I've seen even pictures which suggest to me, I mean, this is not something we've seen in months, right? So I've seen mm -hmm. um, pictures of Makele, uh, not necessarily with soldiers, but with, you know, indications or, 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 or sort of suggestions that these are fresh pictures. Of course, it's difficult to tell with the internet. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm being very careful to point out that this is purely, you know, this is not something that I've been able to confirm, but indications are at, at the very least, there's a lot of optimism and people are saying that the ENDF is indeed in Makele and um, and everywhere they've been, they're distributing food and um, sort of making it clear that the Tigray people are Ethiopian and um, and they're there to free the people from uh, the TPLF. So a, a, a big distinction. And I've seen that campaign kind of unfold over the last few months and you know, it's been beautiful to watch because it changed from, you know, Tigray to TPLF versus mm -hmm. Ethiopians in the Tigray region, um, as opposed to uh, the, you know, the Tigray people, right? It's all, it's, it's been, there was a very clear distinction and, and, um, you know, it's, it's exciting for me as, as a Pan-African, um, as a Pan-Africanist, uh, both observer as well as, uh, as, I mean, participant, like um, I, I am part of this uh, continent, uh, both as an observer in terms of the way the Ethiopians have conducted um, this fight, this anti-imperialist fight, because that really is what it has been as well as somebody who's who's very much uh, a participant in in at least in the in the information um war aspect of it it's it, it's been quite a learning experience to show you know just the observation that the west and the imperialist forces they're not as strategic and as smart as we assumed, and and maybe not even as powerful, right? They they can be overcome because mm -hmm. one and one of the reasons being just how lazy the, um, the 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 imperialist playbook is. Like it's just copy pasted, and so all it takes is Uhuru Kenyatta and and Abiy Ahmed and Ruta coming together and with, with their sort of unclear bromance and kind of like just doing a, a you know pulling a few uh, unpredictable moves and voila like I mean and I, I don't want to oversimplify it but it does seem like it's you know the, the playbook is not that complicated I think that's something we've already established absolutely the playbook book rather it's very early here playbook this <laughs> is early in the mouth is still practicing we're talking uh, but the playbook is um it's very simple for africa because there's a lot of people who don't understand africa even in the most so-called like progressive rooms you know, I find myself having to say, listen, I know you are a progressive or, uh, but your perceptions on Africa are still really outdated. Um, you know, you might have certain ideas about, you know, Venezuela and South America and, and Asia, but there's some things about Africa that you're kind of taking as is, which are really so similar in terms of their, the structure of the issues as the other parts of the world that you understand as far as developing worlds or develop, but in the global South and dealing with a lot of, um, you know, Western aggression. I mean, even I think, um, you know, Africans from the continent, you know, I'll speak for Ethiopians to some degree, you know, we just got used to the stereotype, you know, we just got used to 
um, sort of being defined, at least for some time, not in recent years, uh, for, for years after the, the, the famine in 1980s, which was not this black and white story that was told back then. I mean, the TPLF was very much involved in that story too. And the propaganda apparatus of the West was also very much involved in that story. If there was nuance in that story and context, then it wouldn't just be that Ethiopia was defined by a famine. It would be that there was this war, capitalism versus communism, you know, all over the world it was happening and it was coming to a head in different countries, including in Ethiopia. And it was the last few years of the 80s where the TPLF used the people of Tigray and their suffering, um, you know, some of it natural suffering, others, uh, you know, they may have, uh, ports of fuel on in order to get international attention. And then this huge concert fundraiser, We Are the World, with all these famous uh, names was put together here in the United States. Um, and $100 million was raised, a large majority of it, 95 million, allegedly went to buy weapons and not actually to feed the people. But nobody looked back and asked. They just thought, oh, we came together for these um, you know, hungry Africans and we did our part. And moved on and then so when you see in 2020 when that framework is trying to be rehashed when the context has changed so much then you realize oh they're just pulling out the playbook from the 80s they're not really expecting us to speak up and say wait a minute this is a very different uh scenario that we're talking about so i do agree with you the the playbook is is oversimplified and that's why we're able to get to this point but um and i don't know if they're smart or hardworking the people that write the playbooks, but if they're smart and have some work ethic, they're gonna try to update it. I mean, I think some of the violence that we see uh, in Ethiopia pop up from time to time, um, you know, I don't know the the frequency of it, but the ones that are this, where the scale is very significant. Um, I, you know, I suspect that has a lot of Western hand in it, a lot of TPLF hand in it, because they know when the people, um, when there's people on the ground that suffer, particularly if they're targeted because of their ethnicity, it really divides the people um, against this government. So that's part of the, I think, the, the tactic that's been a little bit more updated. And yes, they're powerful, but they're only powerful because we allow them to divide us over and over again. So the divide and conquer concept is very real, but if the divide part, if there's more resilience towards the divide part, then the conquering is not so easy. So I agree with you there too, that their power is as, um, as, 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 as uh, important and palpable and as impactful as we are divided. And so when we are not divided, you see that, oh, wow, we are actually able to advance. Yeah, so not to, again, so not to oversimplify it, but, um, but in a way, it, it is simple uh, not to be confused with easy, right? Um, when, when we unite, uh, quite simply, it, it is the antidote right? Uh, unity is the antidote to, of course, it's the antidote to the divide. Um, but it's also the antidote to the to the conquer, because without the divide, there is no conquer. Um, or at the very least, the conquer is, you know, is, is that much harder. Make and it work. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And so, I'm sorry, I actually missed that. Oh, I said make them work. It's the audio. Make, make them work make at them the very least. Or conquer. <laughs> exactly. I hand it to but, them. <laughs> exactly. But uh, but 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 I but I think it it is more than that. I think it is more than just that. It makes it that much harder. I think that it it does. What what I'm seeing here is that um, what it appears at least is that there is that that with unity uh, it is possible to defeat. Um, uh, the, the conquest and it is possible to actually move the needle. Um, and, you know, and we are seeing this, of course, we are seeing this in Ethiopia, uh, which is, of course, we are looking at the Horn of Africa today, specifically Ethiopia, but also we are seeing this in, in other places like Mali, where one single general, you know, seems to be actively working and seemingly succeeding uh, to defeat um, the the French and and um, you know who 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 I think are even lazier in their <laughs> in their imperialist playbook, um, but uh, you know and and back to the talks today, um, it's 
it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens tomorrow because uh, specifically because it, things are moving so fast and I can't help wondering um, and, and I'm really curious to know whether we, you know, what what confirmations we, we we've gotten, if any, about um, uh, about the uh, uh, about the the ENDF's progress today. I can't help thinking, what, you know, will will it be a, a discussion about peace talks tomorrow, or will it really be a discussion about an exit strategy? For the TPLF or negotiating the, the terms of their freedom, if any, right? So I'm I'm really very curious. I mean, it's everything is moving so fast, but I can't help thinking that it's going to be a very different discussion tomorrow. Um, Absolutely. And one thing, though, the other noises that I've been seeing is that um, I've been seeing noises about suggestions coming from the West, apparently, that there should be some type of inclusion of these um, agents of doom and death into, um, into, the, into the Ethiopian government. I mean, there is an, a, a, a sitting elected Ethiopian government, a cabinet, like, I don't know, you know, how do you reconstitute a sovereign government uh, to include terrorists, essentially, like, makes no sense. Um, you know, and they've used this playbook very recently in Somalia, right, where, where we have a minister from Al-Shabaab even uh, being, um, you know, being appointed into, into government. Uh, I, I just don't see that happening in Ethiopia. Right. There's, I mean, there's a lot of implications there if, if, if the Ethiopian government was going to try to do that. I mean, first, I am of the mind that there's certain people that people would have less problem with. I, I, I don't know if that's true. Maybe it's just my perspective. I think people like Yitach Choreta, who definitely, you know, he's the spokesperson, but I, I think he's someone that was sort of dragged into it. I mean, maybe many of them are and, and isn't known to to be particularly cruel or to have been a part of the decision-making to go to war. So I don't know if there's somebody like that that would be allowed to go into the fold after some period of arrest or whatever the case. But I think in general, um, the longer this war went, the more irreconcilable it became. So two years later and three different offensives, you know, the people just, there's no reason to, to believe that the TPLF will exist without violence, that they will use any position that they're given to continue to foment violence. I mean, they have a long hand, a long apparatus that is, you know, still being worked on to this day. I mean, you don't see these random acts of violence um, in, in many cases without external interference or, or, or different groups fueling them. I remember in December, 2020, this is one of the moments of like of revelation for me. I watched Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's parliament speech. It was a long speech. Um, and you know, I was uh, still a TPLF fight for anybody looking from on the outside. I was still very much buying the narrative. So, but after that speech, I thought, wait a minute, there might be something there. Because one of the questions that I would push back on with people is, how is it that the TPLF is responsible for all of these different uh, you know, uh, acts of violence that's happening across the country? How could they be everywhere? They're not a god. Um, and then, you know, a lot of people would often be just too emotional to try to explain it well, or, you know, I wasn't ready to hear it as well. So I won't put it all on them. But during that speech, um, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed went through exactly the steps of how they investigated those uh, uh, mass acts of violence and how they were able to determine that the local federal police, the regional police were involved in facilitating the violence. So they would go into these different regions and talk to the people and say, what's going on here? You know, what's what's different? And they would talk to people and they would say, well, you know, we used to have some clashes among Or Oromos and Amharas, but it was never guns. It was just maybe fights. Uh, we used to, you know, have these clashes at night, but they never was were pulling out guns during the day. So they would see all these difference. Uh, they, they would investigate the difference. And then uh, what they ultimately did is, uh, you know, they would have somebody that's accused of 
killing a bunch of people and they would go into that 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 person's house and find just just loads of cash and it it, it was it was a you know a, a poor farmer uh someone that had no business having that much cash or there was no reason to to think that they would have that much much cash so what they would do is because they suspected it was the, the local police that were facilitating this so what they would do is they would remove them all and then tell the special forces that they brought in all right if you see any of the old local police federal police regional police shoot them on the spot they would tell those people if you come in there's orders to shoot you on the spot and when they did that these acts of violence would go away and they would see that over and over again so i remember talking to a friend of mine uh you know who's still very much on the tplf line of uh, thinking as far as i know and they're thinking how can you believe that and i thought just watch it just watch the one hour parliament speech and tell me that you, this doesn't make sense. No, you can't make up things like that. And so for the first time, um, I thought, oh, somebody gave me like a legitimate explanation of how it was that the TPLF were involved because they were in government for 27 years. They have all these loyalists, they have all of this money, uh, so they're able to do it. So I, I would just wanna tell everybody that just may have walked in we're discussing some of the, the implications of the peace talks that uh, are happening in South Africa this week. It sounds like not much happened today. It's end of the day um, in South Africa. And so the talks have been uh, moved along to uh, to Tuesday. Um, I'm joined with my uh, colleague, Kenyan American journalist Karanja Gashesha, and we'll be co hosting the next hour or so. We've got a couple of guests, including attorney Dereja Demise, who will give us uh, the legal angle uh, of this, and then Graham Peebles, who's an author. Um, out of the UK will probably join us either before or after. Um, Karanja, I don't know if you've seen this AU, um, this letter to the AU that, that lists all the people that are that are going there, but it, it has, let's see here, it has seven people as the delegation they'll represent Tigray and then their security personnel, five people. And so in the, in the, uh, in the top two is Gifacho Redda, who's probably the only person that knows how to speak well English, English <laughs> from the crew, so it makes sense. Uh, and then actually General Zabkan, excuse me, he's, I think, I think he's good too, at least in terms of communication. And then you've got Ambassador Wandumu As Asamano, I'm not sure who that is. Uh, we'll ask Dereja, maybe he is, knows of some of these people, Dr. Fisaha, uh, Haftetsion, Mr. Uh, Tawalde, Gebritz and I, I believe that's one of the, um, the generals, Mr. Kasa Gebritz, Gabriel Johannes and Mr. Asafa Abraha, which I believe that was, uh, yeah, that was, he's related to one of the TPLF members. So if anybody actually knows who some of these people are, let me know um, so that we're able to get a little bit of context. Um, but, you know, in general, Karanja, you know, seeing how, how this is moving um, in terms of the way that it's, it feels like there's some chess being played, from the Kenyan perspective, especially since we just signed a bunch of deals between Kenya and Ethiopia, it, seem, it would seem to me that Kenya is now more invested in peace in Ethiopia and the larger Horn of Africa. It would seem so. I do believe it is the case. Um, and not just the Kenyan government, but the Kenyan people too, right? Because um, the Kenyan people have been following that story specifically because of that um, uh, President Ruto's trip to Ethiopia. Um, and, I, I, you know, I, I do have to say, I do think that um, uh, the, 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 the Kenyan population is very much focused on economics um, to, to a fault, to, to the point that they, they sort of um, disregard almost every other consideration, um, it appears, it, it, it feels that way. And so I, I've actually been seeing Kenyans tweet, for example, about the fact that uh, we have a, a, a strong interest in maintaining peace in Ethiopia because of our investments via Safaricom and uh, Equity Bank. Um, that, that wasn't featured during that trip, but actually, you know, Equity Bank is, is another Kenyan business that's making a strong headway 
into uh, the Ethiopian market. And so, uh, yes, Kenya, Kenyans are invested in, in the outcome. And uh, indeed, uh, the Kenyan government has a strong reason to make sure that, um, you know, that, 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 this, that, that, that peace breaks out. Um, and of course, Ruto has something to prove, right? He's, he's somebody who came into power with very, there was very little expectation that he was going to be the next president. You know, the, the international community had written him off. By the way, I, 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 I don't know if we talked about this when, when we had the discussion about his election, but <laughs> when, when he traveled to uh, the United States in the spring, uh, Chris Coons canceled his meetings with Ruto and all congressional sort of meetings that had been planned were canceled. And um, the the Brits proceeded to do the same. And, you know, he had planned a trip to the United Kingdom after the United States. And so they, they did the same, you know, uh, officials in the British government also canceled their meetings. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the uh, Ruta, um, the Ruta delegation, which by the way, was a very small, honestly, there's no other word for it, pitiful looking <laughs> de delegation with very little crowds, even here in the United States. I mean, I, I, I got to interact with literally all of them. There was just free, um, you know, free, uh, access because there, it was such a small delegation. There was such few attendees. Um, so there was very little expectation that he was going to be president. The international community had written him off. And to a, to a certain extent, even Kenyans who supported him were supporting him and, and being hopeful, but still had, I think, it was probably something like 60% to 40% still expected that Ryla would still end up being president. So he has a lot to prove uh, because of that in the East African region, um, but also in, you know, to the international community. I, I feel like he definitely has a bone to pick with the likes of Chris Coons. Uh, when Chris Coons visited Kenya immediately after the election, uh, Ruto reminded him that he had canceled <laughs> their the meeting. Um, he did not you know, forget. And he, and just for those of you that are looking, uh, Ruto is on the left, Uhuru Kenyatta, the former president of Kenya, is on the right. Go ahead, Karanja. Yeah, absolutely. And that's Raila Odinga, who was absolutely the one that was expected to, to take over from um, Uhuru. You know, Ruto made a point of uh, pointing out to Chris Coons that, uh, oh yeah, by the way, I was in um, the United States uh, in the spring, and um, unfortunately, we had a meeting that was planned that ended up not happening. But here we are. <laughs> you know that that was how that was presented, but really, it was well. Look at you now, I'm president. Right. Remember so me? I do believe he has a lot. Of, sorry. What's that? Is it remember me? Remember when you said <laughs> exactly me? right? Yeah. And um, yeah, so so I do believe he has a lot to prove, and so I think that he's going out of his way in addition to what he considers Kenyan interests, which um, frustratingly to me are, are seem to be purely just. Uh, the calculus is economic purely. I mean, which is understandable, but I, I I would hope that there was more of a geopolitical kind of emphasis in of national interest being more than just um, economic. Uh, sort of, a, I, I don't get the impression that the Kenyan administration, whether it's Ruto, frankly, or Uhuru before him, I don't get the impression that they view sort of uh, strategic, sort of, you know, positioning themselves strategically um, or pr positioning Kenya strategically squarely within the East African region and the African region um, in general uh, is, is I, I don't I don't feel that they view it as the national uh, security. Uh, geopolitical interest that it really is. Uh, I, I think that they sort of look at it very purely from an economic perspective. But 
even from just from the economic perspective, uh, I, I think there's a strong incentive to, you know, to, to maintain peace in the region for that reason, because the East African region is expanding. Uh, but like I said, I, I wish that they sort of treated the pure geopolitics, economics or not, as important as I truly believe they are. Yeah, I mean, if you if you have your money tied into it, you're going to be a little bit more invested, uh, I believe. So I want to ask you a couple of uh, more questions. I want to remind everybody, if you're watching, make sure you have subscribed. I find that a lot of people watch without hitting subscribe. I do it too. We're all watch videos, but I don't subscribe to that particular account. Um, and so make sure you hit subscribe, make sure you send this to the, all the different group chats I know that everybody's involved in, uh, whether it's on uh, the different apps or on Twitter. So please subscribe, it, it, it makes a difference. Uh, there's also the super chat option, uh, but we have to be able to create these spaces where we as Africans are analyzing what's going on on the ground and not just reacting to what the mainstream media is saying, which is often a very twisted version uh, of what's going on. So please make sure you support. Uh, uh, Karanja also has briefscoop.com, briefscoop.com. So check that out um, and we'll continue to build on uh, African media and stories about Africa from the perspective of the African people, um, it's its long overdue. So please make sure you, you uh, subscribe and share and support and look for uh, people that you uh, trust to be able to tell um, Africa stories. So with that said, while we're waiting for our next guest, which is likely to be uh, Daraja Demise, but it might be uh, writer uh, Graham Peebles, what uh what's the story in uh kenyan media karanja in terms of how do they look at uh what's going on in ethiopia is there a, a you know a full understanding of who the players are and what the stakes are um uh i'll have you get into that a little bit and it looks like graham has joined us backstage so i'll pull him up after we get into that um okay so i'm, I'm gonna go into that quickly <laughs> very quickly actually because there's very little to say about it because unfortunately Kenyan media to be honest really get the information from Western media and so as much as uh, the, the information that Kenyans have about the conflict is that there is a genocide in Tigray and that um, what needs to happen is for the international community to step in and um, talk sense into the Ethiopian government. That has been the prevailing sort of attitude. And Kenyans sort of have this detached kind of perspective of, you know, we need to have peace in the region because, you know, it might affect us. But other than that, you know, there, there's a certain detachment from uh, a deeper understanding. Um, and so, you know, whatever the prevailing view is of, of Western media is going to be copy pasted into um, Kenyan uh, media. It's surprising because you would think, I mean, Kenyan media, some, some Kenyan media houses really are quite big and they can afford the resources to send journalists into, for God's sake, let's even just limit it to the East African region, forget the whole African you know, continent. Uh, but that's just not something that happens, right? And so they, they've kind of followed on to what Western media does, which is just report everything around about the, that whole, the whole sort of Eastern Central uh, Horn of Africa region from Nairobi, right? I guess they figured, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, which is frustrating and which is why we have to step in and do better. Uh, as independent media, you know, I want to be able to uh, travel to Ethiopia and do um, the, the work, that legwork that's not being done. Um, and by the way, we, uh, there, there, there's, there's, an, there's an interesting question uh, in the comments from Mayan Yitzhak, which was, I'm asking both of you as international journalists, why Western conspirators to weaken, uh, Westerners conspire I guess, uh, I'm paraphrasing, uh, to weaken the decision-making capacity of the African Union, which is an interesting question, which I think we, I, I expect we should, we, we might want to explore at some point, right, in the discussion. Yeah. 
The African Union is a very interesting body to me, and I still don't fully understand it. I mean, it's, it's in my perspective, built the way the UN is with this air of independence, air of representation of the African continent. But there's a lot of uh, different Western hands in it. So I don't necessarily put all my faith in the African Union as an institution. Um, but I think there may be individuals within and there may be the way things are uh, maneuvered, such as Uhuru Kenyatta not showing up to the last talks. Maybe you'll show up to these talks. I mean, those are the players I, you know, think will make the difference. I think the African Union as a body is seems very much controlled, um, you know, by the West and uh, but again, all these institutions, what's, what makes them so tricky is because I do believe there are individuals, including in the United Nations, that want to do the right thing, that, that do their jobs to the utmost integrity, but um, in some cases are hampered by the institutions and the bureaucracy and certain players such as the United Nations, World Health Organization, Tedros Adhanom, a known TPLF executive member. And so having people like him in those positions can intimidate others, can override uh, the fact finding of others. So I uh, suspect that that's how the African Union uh, runs as well. Graham, let me know and give me a, hand, a, a thumbs up uh, whenever you're ready. Uh, but for those of you who are joining in, we're discussing uh, the peace talks that are underway in South Africa. It looks like they've moved to Tuesday, so not much uh, really happened today. We were told that uh, the TPLF representatives, a total of seven plus their security, have arrived in South Africa. We're also told some Ethiopian representatives have arrived. I do believe I saw something saying that the Ethiopian foreign minister was not there and they sent some lower level um, Ethiopian representatives to to uh, to be a part of these talks. Uh, we haven't gotten word as to whether um, Uhuru Kenyatta has made it yet, but uh, Karanja did uh, check in with some sources that said that we've gotten the request, but we don't have information about whether he's arrived yet. So um, we're going to bring in Graham Peebles here. He's written um, a lot of articles actually about the, the, the TPLF. I, I interviewed him some months back um, uh, on the TPLF, seems to understand it better than most. So I want to bring him in here. Let's, let's see if he's um, ready and uh, get his take. Graham, welcome. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Very well. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Thanks for making the time. Really appreciate it. Karanja uh, Gachesha with me here, Kenyan American journalist. So we'll be sort of co-hosting uh, this with you. Um, nice to meet you. You know, I saw that you... I saw that you, uh, you know, you, you, you tweeted today, important day for Ethiopia, government goes to South Africa with the people roaring behind them, as we saw this weekend. Uh, they must be strong and resist U.S. manipulation and TPLF demands. TPLF must disarm. The country is not safe until they do. God bless the negotiators. You know TPLF better than most. Can yeah, you yeah. expand on that tweet and the ideas in that tweet that the country is not safe until TPLF is disarmed? Well, it's, it, it's clear if you look not just at the last two years, but, you know, the period that the TPLF were in office for 27 years, you know, they were brutal. You know, they carried out acts of state terrorism throughout the country. Um, and they were only allowed to stay in office with the support from the West. And when we say the West, you know, of course, what we really mean, you know, international foreign policy is dictated, Western international foreign policy is largely dictated by the US. So, you know, they were, they were kept in power by US support, financial, military, and political. And then, you know, we thought we'd got rid of them. They disappeared. We thought we... <laughs> 
I'm okay. here. I'm here with you. I'm just okay, giving you the stage. I'm talking to myself, Amela, which is which is a regular occurrence these days, anyway. But I'm um, here with you, by the way. I'm just giving you the center stage. <laughs> no, no, please stay there. I feel, you know, okay, gotcha. Like, I'm here. I'm here with you. <laughs> like I'm sitting on my own, uh, left in London, talking to the wall. Um, you're good. So please continue. So yeah, um, you know, and then 2018, we thought we'd got rid of them. Well, I thought we'd got rid of them. Maybe, you know, in one's naivety, we hoped and thought we'd got rid of them. But, you know, they were hidden away in some, you know, wardrobe somewhere in Tigray, you know, plotting and scheming and and planning to somehow, you know, reemerge and steal back power with the US, the support of the US. And you know, it's been a ghastly two years. I mean, I, you know, I, it's funny, I was just writing a new essay um, before we spoke and, you know, I don't know whether we should, but I'm, I, you know, one's almost talking as if the wars come to an end. Now, that's, maybe that's premature. I mean, it's, I don't know, it's, but um, from what, from what one can see from a distance, and of course, it's always difficult to make these judgments, but it looks like militarily the TPLF are finished. I mean, it's, you know, the danger always then is that group becomes what it's, what it's already being called, but it isn't that at the moment, which is an insurgent force, you know, and they slip even further into the, um, the dregs of, um, of Tigray, and then they just, you know, carry out hideous attacks from time to time. So it's, so how do you stop that? You know, what do you do with a force like the TPLF? You know, how do you, it's, I mean, I was thinking at the weekend, really, you know, if there was, I mean, I suppose we put it as a question. I mean, I voiced it as a statement, but, you know, no, no US support, no TPLF. You know, if the US hadn't supported the TPLF, I mean, I know that the TPLF have got enormous funds, you know, hidden away. So would they have used those funds to launch a military attack as they did in November 2020 without US support? I don't know. I think it's probably unlikely. So no US, no TPLF. No TPLF, no war. No war, no deaths, no rapes, no destruction, no national trauma. You know, I want to I want to expand on what you just said. It it seems to me that the way that the U.S. is 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 so adamant about essentially kicking the can down the road on this war, getting uh, both sides to the the negotiation table um, in order for this not to be a military um, finish. Uh, you know, causing all of this hysteria when the Ethiopian um, government, Ethiopian National Defense Forces are, are making such advancements. Um, it, it, it reads guilty. Uh, it reads guilty in the sense that, you know, if it's just a TPLF that made this decision, they're, they, they've made their bed, they're going to have to live with it. They're, it's just going to play out as it does. But it almost seems like the TPLF, or rather the U.S. is personally uh you know freaking out about the prospect of this ending and the ethiopian government going in and actually having the 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 ability to investigate without all of this interference so how involved do you think the u.s may have been i mean if the u.n head of world health organization was orchestrating aid to go to the rebels as opposed to civilians during this war he's a tplf executive member the U.S. is the number one funder for the U.N. I mean, how deep do you think this might go in terms of uh, accomplices? I mean, it's I, it's so difficult to judge, isn't it? I mean, I think that the it's, you know, but if you look at the way that the U.S. have, if you, uh, okay, so if we said this is an, uh, a conflict that is initiated and maintained by a particular group. In this case, it's the TPLF. If we just said that, and that there's no, you know, the, the, the spurious claims of US involvement are not, not, not substantiated, you know, as a debate. And then, okay, okay, well, maybe that's true. So let's, let's look at how the US have responded to this crisis. 
have they been, you know, an honest voice? Have they condemned TPLF atrocities? Have they supported the democrat? You know, the first democratically elected government in Ethiopia's history. Have they stood by them and supported them in a way that they they would be expected to do? Were they neutral? So it's you know you can't I, I, you, you, I can't prove I I don't know anybody that can prove that you know the the U.S. administration is putting guns in the hands of the TPLF and and giving them information about the um, federal forces and where they are and so on. But we can look at what they've done, you know, imposing sanctions on Ethiopia. You know, I mean, it's, it's an absurd thing to do. One of the poorest nations in the world, um, you know, giving out misinformation, disinformation, uh, false press briefings, um, and then, you know, garnering um, their allies' support along their own particular um, view of what was taking place. So it's, I think really though, Hamela, I mean, I'd like to, you know, the West is in crisis. You know, all Western nations are in major crisis. It's, it's political, economic, social, but it's an ideological cultural crisis that, that, that the West is facing. The old ways of doing things don't funk, don't work anymore. The systems are collapsing. So the one of those, um, um, th that, that socioeconomic system that underpins everything that they've done since the Second World War is the, is the neoliberal model. And that's been exported and shapes the development paradigm that's been sold to the African nations. And it is violent, it is exploitative, and it maintains poverty throughout the, the, na the, the continent. So it's, I, I think this is a tremendous opportunity for African nations. And I think that, you know, Ethiopia coming out of this conflict, which, you know, God hope we are, then Ethiopia can, can be a leading voice in this change. I think the change has to be away from the West. You know, don't look to the West anymore. You know, don't look to their ideas. Don't look for their money. You know, look within so that Africa starts to look. So whatever, so my point is whatever the Americans have done, to hell with them. You know, really to hell with them. You know, they're a pernicious, dishonest, poisonous force in the world. You know, I, you know, if you, if you just go on to the internet and look at the number of wars that America has either initiated or funded or supported since the Second World War, it's an endless list. You know, so I, to, to your point, I don't know if you saw Jeffrey Sachs' um, um, presentation at the uh, so-called democracy conference in, um, was it in Australia, I think it might have been, or or in Norway, I forget where it was, it was in some democratic <laughs> country, <laughs> where the, um, the host stopped Jeffrey Sachs as soon as he said, you know, he, he was saying how democracy doesn't equal peace uh, and lack of violence. And he pointed out that the United Kingdom, um, you know, one of the oldest quote unquote democracies. I, I don't know how that figures being that it's a monarchy, but um <laughs> yeah, uh, can, can that you know, well, but yeah. Right. Was the most violent. And then um the 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 host tried to stop him. Uh, and then he went on to say, you know, until 1950, and then from 1950, he says, and the most violent since then, which of course, everyone just knew was coming, is the United States. Uh, at which point the host said, enough, uh, Mr. Sachs, and literally stopped him. I don't, have you seen that? I that means it's going that. But to your point. That. But he talks a lot, he talks a lot of sense, I have to say. Right. So to your point, uh, and I can't help wondering, I mean, this whole thing is so curious to me 
and and so complicated and so difficult to to understand and even listening to you you know i i can hear the pains to sort of make sense of all of this and i can't help wondering is it really as simple for the united states as the fact that tplf members having looted 30 billion dollars i'm guessing they've invested the great bulk of it well all of it in the west and the great bulk of it quite probably in the United States. Is it as simple as that? Or is it that as well as the ability to keep the cow essentially alive, you know, the milk cow alive for continued, um, you know, future sort of uh, economic milking? I mean, is it that simple? Because to your point, the, 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 the vigor with which the the international community has enabled, um, a, a, and I don't know how uh, um, implicitly it is. I kind of feel like it's relatively explicit. Uh, it, it 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 seems like there's a very strong vested interest. Yeah, I mean, I think it's. I don't, I mean, it's not, obviously geopolitics is unbelievably complicated, but at the heart of it is power. You know, so whatever the, 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 the machinations and the, you know, the goings on in the corridors and so on, it's, it's ultimately about power and maintaining control. So the US wants control. It wants control of the Horn of, of Africa, or, you know, if not control, it wants substantial influence it doesn't care about the tplf you know if abby was malleable they'd quite happily work through abby just as well as they'd work through the tplf you know they have no loyalty to these groups other than the group um you know pledges or is is a consistent um supporter and of 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 the american agenda it's... I guess that's my confusion because then why so so much vigor behind TPLF? I mean, to your point, it could it might as well uh, be, you know, I, I can't think that Abby would necessarily push back if he became a darling of the West to the extent that they wanted to be able to invest right in Ethiopia, I, and I kind of feel like I, I don't want to move this conversation too far away. But I kind of feel like it's exactly this what what I've seen happen in Kenya, whereby they were really rooting for one candidate, Raila, and when he didn't, you know, when it was very clear that he wasn't, there was no way to install him, and there, you know, and and there was a very democratic uh, election that just couldn't be twisted any other way. They seemed to be quickly stepping in to sort of try and court Ruto. Why couldn't they just do that in Ethiopia? Well, they would do that in Ethiopia, but Abby's, not, Abby's I don't think Abby is as, as, as easily influenced. You know, he's, I mean, it's difficult to tell because he's had such a short time in office, really, and it's been such a difficult time. You know, he came into the office 2018, so it wasn't really until the end of 2018, stroke 2019, that they were organized. And then there was a war, and then there's COVID, and, you know, and plus various other um, law and order issues in the country. So it's been an ex unbelievably difficult time. But he strikes me as a decent man, you know, who is independent, um, I think seems to be perhaps uh, sometimes too strongly on the on the side of tolerance and forgiveness. But you know, that perhaps that will change. And given the brutality of the previous regime, it's perhaps understandable. But I don't think it's, I mean, it's funny, actually, we've got an election, well, you'd have probably seen we have a new prime minister, another new prime minister in Britain today. They are the third new one. About, the the third one. About, the one. You know, <laughs> yeah, the, third, yeah, the third in 48 hours, I think it is. <laughs> uh, there'll be another one at the weekend, so. <laughs> They're all idiots anyway, so it doesn't really make any difference. But, but listening to MP, conservative MPs, and this is absolutely in response to what you've just said, the, 
one minute they're supporting one candidate, the next minute when that candidate doesn't seem to be doing quite so well, <laughs> they switch their support to somebody else. You know, and that's what it's like. You know, the they these they have no these politicians, they have no integrity, they have no principles, they have no loyalties. They, their only loyalty is to power. That's their loyalty. You know, they're and the, the and I think funnily enough, I was I mean this is a slightly, you know, um difficult things to substantiate perhaps, but and I, I would say fear. I think you know a lot of you know America is incredibly fearful. It's enormously powerful militarily and economically. It's juvenile as a nation. You know, I wrote today that it was adolescent, but actually compared to Ethiopia and Kenya and so on, it's newborn. You know, but at the same time, you so you have this 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 newborn who can't really think clearly. <laughs> Two year old. <laughs> With these enormous weapons of, that that they can do, so you know, and and this sort of paranoia that 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 the country seems to be in the grip of constantly. They, you know, this total because it's such an introspective nation, no real understanding of the world, you know, no no culture of its own to speak of, and. You know, a, a complete lack of humility. It's, it, it's. So that fear, and that enormous self-centered um, position from which it it moves, that seems to color and direct everything it does. It, it's funny to hear you say that because I've often described the American sort of national psyche as a very two-year-old type, you know, yeah. <laughs> self-absorbed yeah. and yeah, completely stamp, uncritical. Stamping, stamping its feet, you know. <laughs> with, an, with, a, with enormous power, and yeah. uh, unfortunately, exactly. right? Yeah. Right. So, you know, what's interesting about what you guys are saying about the paranoia point, I think is so interesting. I think... You know, the TPLF really had this incredible opportunity to walk away without facing violence, as is often the case in transition um, in Ethiopian history. I mean, you look at the feudal government uh, uh, being overthrown violently by the communist government of the Derg. Uh, the communist government of the Derg was a, a militarily defeated by the then TPLF-led uh, EPRDF coalition. This is the first transition, uh, and I would argue, you know, the 27 years were very lucrative for the TPLF, and they got away with a lot. And so, I think they're they almost couldn't believe that they were getting that kind of a deal. And my take is, and I think this 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 uh, describes uh, the United States as well. When you have been so brutal, when you've been so greedy, and you know what you've done to people, you just can't fathom that if given the power, they won't do it to you. You know, I don't think the TPLF thought that they could live, uh, or I don't think they thought that there would be a different kind of government. They lived by the gun. They were so used to having 100% control and they didn't feel safe if they didn't have that because they know what they have done, but they've gotten you know incredibly lucky. The Ethiopian people, the Eritrean people are almost you know just uh, shockingly forgiving to some extent. They were okay with a lot of the leadership not going to jail. Um, yeah, they exhausted Hamela. You know, I think that's it's it's sometimes why, you know, why aren't the streets of our nations, you know, filled with people, you know, throwing petrol bombs through government institutions, and it, because the injustices, social injustices, and the hardships that most of us live by are so acute, and the reason is, you know, the a system has been created that that it people are drained. You know, they're physically exhausted, they're men mentally and emotionally in tatters. And, you know, after 27 years of, you know, living under this, un under a shadow of tremendous fear, you know, to be relieved from that. And also then, you're, that, that, that fear doesn't suddenly go away. 
you know, it's like an abused child and they take, you know, the, the, the abusive parent isn't there anymore. They're not suddenly free from being frightened. Sure. So you have a traumatized nation in many ways, I'm sure. And, you know, there needs to be healing. Um, can I can I briefly respond to, to something you said then about democracy not equaling peace, which Sachs said? I don't think that's true at all. I think democracy, absolutely, true democracy, absolutely there would be peace. But there is no true democracy. So you'd have to, def you'd have to first of all, describe what you mean by, by democracy, I suppose. And, it's, and the, the other thing I, I wanted to say is that if you, you know, whether it's individually co or collectively, the, how do you create peace? in a nation, in a family, in a society. And so I, I, my, my view, and just to, as a starting point, would be that the, I don't think you have to create peace. Peace is not something you need to bring about. Peace is something that if you took away the elements that created conflict would naturally arise so then you have then you have to say okay what are those elements that create the conflict and identify what those are within the relationship within the society within the nation within the world and, and take those away now those elements are uh, tribalism competition um, ideologies of essentially all kinds now those these are the, 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 the principles under which, you know, the, the powerful nations of the world, particularly the US, operate. So it's, I mean, you could say the TPLF is the root, is the cause of the conflict in, 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 in Ethiopia. And, and without the TPLF, yes, probably there wouldn't have been a conflict. But they're still, the, they are the, the the fact that the TPLF exists, existed, and was was able to carry out the terrible acts that they that they, they carried out is part of that overall system in which we're living, and it's a system. Sorry, Emma. No, no, no. Finish your thought because I want you to connect that concept of taking away the things that create conflict to get peace to then back to the uh, the the peace talks this week. Um, yeah, but yeah, no, yeah. finish that thought too. Yeah, no. It's so there. There's still a consequence, and the 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 motor, the sort of engine for that uh, mode of living. You know, those is is an ideology that that the US is deeply wedded to and West, other Western nations as well. Um, so it's, we need systemic change. We need a change in values so that, you know, those, we've got to get rid of nationalism. All forms of tribal nationalism have got to go. It's unbelievably divisive um, and inherently, you know, conflicting. So that needs to go. So. It's these nationalism, are all when you mean uh, when you say nationalism, define that ethnic based nationalism or well, I mean, I you know, I'm I'm I live in Britain, um, it's not we don't have eth well, we do it is a very ethnically diverse country, but there's it's not a nation that was that is built on different ethnic groups so. It's always been quite difficult for me to understand the the strong adherence that people have to ethnic identities. Um, and I've never really thought of myself as English or British, you know, or anything, <laughs> you know, human, maybe not quite, but we don't really know what that is. So, you know, that's. So, so you something. mean nationalism uh, as in like when it gets toxic, when it becomes that. It's always toxic. Mm -hmm. It's always toxic. You know, any sense that you are an individual separate from another individual, whether that's so all ideologies and, you know, nationalism is an ideology. Just 
in the same way that religious ideologies are. You know, if if we believe that we, you know, if we do, if we define ourselves based around these identities, they are separative and divisive, and inherently, um, there is conflict inherent in that. You know, so we have to start to move towards breaking down these whatever causes division. We need to start to break it down. And I would maintain that the same things that cause the division are those same factors that enable conflicts to arise. And at the heart of it is. Pranj, I think you're muted. Sure am. <laughs> Apologies. This is such a big question that you bring up, uh, Graham. Um, and, and I don't want us to get lost in it, but uh, because I, I think it's a whole entire other show, but um, I can't help thinking as you as you raise that uh, living, you know, living here in the United States, like the red versus the blue is very, very tribal you know and 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 the divisions have become so entrenched and to your point you know the united states is not a democracy never has been was never meant to be right and which was part of uh jeffrey sachs uh, uh points he was making about the fact that it was a um a system that was built around slavery and to empower uh slave owners um and, and i don't know how you you know is there a system that is devoid of that? Because this so-called healthy, we refer to it as a healthy competition of ideas and we refer to it as democracy. I've often pointed out that the United States has never been a democracy. The United Kingdom to me is not a democracy either. 300 guys deciding who's going to be prime minister over 60 million people is not, is it even 300? It's more more like 150 because they're, 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 they're the guys. I, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, yeah, it's a classroom. It's a big classroom. Is what it, it, exactly. a small, it's, it's a small primary school. <laughs> well, uh, yes, yeah. a, 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 prep, a prep school, right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> a, a, yeah. a public, uh, you know, yeah. a, a, an extremely wealthy public school. But is that, um, and that's not democracy, but is is that, is there a competition of ideas that, that is healthy then? Because I I see that and, and, and generally we've accepted that as, as, as the way to have a, a, comp uh, a healthy um, competition of ideas that brings about peace. And what we've seen is that it, it I think it, I think the only reason it brings it there is peace in the United Kingdom and the United States is because people are not hungry, right? But with those same divisions, if people were starving, um, it, it, it's a it's a volatile uh, cauldron, and you know, generally, I mean, people, people are increasingly they're not starving, but you know they're certainly peckish. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and we saw the possibilities of that in January 6th. Um, so, and, and so back to say in the Ethiopian context or in the African context, is there a way to sort of have a, a different system that... Um, Absolutely there is. Yeah. And I'm going to preface preface this by saying this is a whole different topic we can get down <laughs> like karan just said this could be a whole so do uh and, Graham, make it like and... a two minute answer so that we okay. don't you know go down that rabbit hole i would let me try can i try to connect it Hermela? sure please yes that would be amazing I, 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 mean, I, don't, I don't think you know all these things are interconnected you know and we it there's no so peace talks in South Africa about creating an end to the conflict in Ethiopia and forms of representative democracy are not separate. It's, you know, Ethiopia is at the beginning of a new stage in its develop in its life. You know, I hate these words. Anyway, so it's, it, so what's it going to look like? 
you know, so we get rid of the TP left. Let's let's assume or let's hope or let's pray that you know these whatever happens over the next few days, the TPLF are finished. You know, and it's it's I hope to God that's the case. You know, I certainly don't in some form, whether they're disbanded or disarmed or whether they, you know, go, you know, I, I read something, some, you know, go, yeah, be exiled in Canada. I don't care where you go, you know, just leave Ethiopia alone. Just go away. You know, I mean, I would have them tried in the international criminal courts, the leaders, but, you know, that's very, very unlikely to happen. But, you know, if we lived in a just democratic world, that would, that would be the case, but they, that's, that won't happen. But so let's hope that, you know, we're, we're free from them. Then what happens? You know, let's, so it's, then there's an enormous amount of work to do in Ethiopia. You know, the country has been decimated. I mean, I spoke to a um, close friend yesterday in Ethiopia who's working in these areas, and she said that virtually every school in Amara has been destroyed. So I don't know whether that's true or whether she was talking about a particular age group of schools or if it, even if half have been destroyed or or made unusable, you know, it's going to take a lot, a long time, a lot of work and a lot of money to reconstruct, you know, the schools and the healthcare systems and the roads and the houses. Where are all in millions of people displaced, where are they going to go? They need homes and so on. So all that's got to be thought through and a way found to fund it and, and a building program. But in terms of I, I suggested to a, um, another Ethiopian activist recently that the the I would what something that I'd love to see in Ethiopia and within the Ethiopian diaspora is citizens' assemblies. So this you know if you lots of us recognise that the existing democratic structures don't work. You know there are not platforms for participation. Um, and it's, you know, most people feel alienated, um, not just politically, but if there's going to be democracy, there has to be democracy in schools and workplaces and so on. And, you know, it's the workers who should run the, the, the factories and the children should have a powerful voice within the education systems that, 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 that they have to attend. So as Ethiopia is at this beginning, this new beginning, I don't see any reason why these things can't start to be discussed. You know, the Western model, and this is why it's, I'm trying to connect to Hamela, that, that, you know, the Western model, the Western socioeconomic model, political model, it's failed. You know, it's failed not only the, their own nations, but it's failed the world. You know, the, it's the, the neoliberal experiment has resulted in an environment which is on its knees, you know, dying. We've practically killed the planet. And that's because of a set of values that are promoted by that neoliberal ideology, in materialistic values that you know, promote the idea that, you know, your lives should be about individual achievement, pleasure. The desire principle is agitated constantly. And the only way to satisfy that is through consuming. So it's destroyed the planet virtually and created unhealthy societies are filled with unhealthy people. You know, you have mental health epidemics in Western nations. So Ethiopia, African nations as a whole, reject that model. You know, as you go, as you embark upon this new journey and this new stage, I would reject that way of doing things. So to extend that, uh, Graham, um, how do you bring the Tigray people, the people of Tigray, right? So exit the TPLF. The people of Tigray uh, are Ethiopian and must be integrated into Ethiopian society. So as the peace talks happen, that has to be the next step. So how do you bring the people of Tigray into this new sort of paradigm that we are, if we can really connect it, right? Because I think that's what we're discussing, a new paradigm, a new paradigm that works for all of Ethiopia and by extension for all of Africa, for any other country. 
And this happens to be a live experiment that we are in. How do you bring the people of Tigray along? Um, and given that there is going to be inevitably a certain number of um, people um, uh, who identify as, as, as Tigrinya or Tigaru that view, that are looking at the peace talks and, and considering people they consider their leaders uh, and, and, and how they are participating and how they are going to be treated uh, in these talks. Um, I, don't, I, mean, I, think, I don't know, so, Pamela. Oh, no, no, I was going to say, uh, we've got Deraja Demise backstage waiting. So uh, I was just going to, I don't know if you, can you stay with us, Graham, or, or, or is your window closing? No, no, it's fine. I'll, okay, I'll, so I'll, 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 I mean, I'll have answer. you answer that and then I'm going to pull up Deraja. So um, we'll, we'll kind of wrap up that point and then I want to bring in Deraja to talk about some of the legal implications of what's going on in South Africa. So how do we bring in or what are the, you know, the, the important elements to consider when it comes to, um, you know, uh, expanding the understanding of the people of Tigray of, of, of what it means to have a democracy or be a part of the fold again? Yeah. I mean, I don't know to what extent the people of Tigray feel excluded, it, you know, is the first point. I, you know, it's the you know, the, the, the war has been against the TPLF, not the Tigray people. So I'm sure there has been examples of discriminative practices towards people from Tigray. But, you know, from what I could see, particularly the gatherings at the weekend, you know, it was brotherhood was the key word and this extension of love to everybody in Ethiopia, including the Tigray people. So I don't know, to what degree that they'll that they feel they're losing they'll be losing their their leaders and i it's i would imagine you know the ones tplf must have been hated throughout the region from the beginning to a greater or lesser degree throughout the war the amount of suffering that that, that their actions have brought to that region and the people of that region have been colossal so therefore i would imagine you know, those that were ambivalent or supportive of the TPLF would now be, you know, seeing sense and rejecting their policies. And then, you know, we've had lots of scenes of them rounding up children within Tigray and hounding um, members of the public to, to force recruitment into their army. So all those things. I think if the TPLF were gone um, and, you know, one thing that, that Abby you know, I've heard him repeatedly say this, and I mean, I've, you know, said it, God knows how, it's unity, 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 unity. You know, the way forward for Ethiopia, the way forward for Africa, the way forward for the world is through unity. You know, people coming together, all these divisions, ethnic, tribal, nationalistic, ideological, religious, all of them, that, like I said before, we have to move to a world in which those elements which separate people are rejected totally, whether they're social, whether they're economic, whatever they are. So the way to, we have to set up platforms of inclusion. So bodies with the broadest spectrum of voices and participation, and, and that's, you know, I go back to the Citizens Assembly idea, which I think is a really good idea for Ethiopia. It's a good idea for everywhere. But if you could take, you know, if, 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 a, if a question could be formulated, not how do, how do we create peace, because we'll be beyond that, but what kind of democracy do you want to live in? Um, you know, what, how do we create social harmony in a country with such tribal and ethnic diversity? And then you, you, then you, then you assemble a group of people that are representative, broadly representative, at random of the population, young, old, and so on. You could have regional assemblies. Those regional assemblies report back to a national assembly, and that national assembly debates and discusses the issues and makes representation to the federal government. You know, it's we have to start to move away from centralized bodies of power and authority to smaller regional community groups which have real influence locally and then nationally so i Absolutely. think it 
Yeah, I think that's a good place to land. And this is actually something I want to expand on with the Raja because we've talked about this, this concept that the people have never decided their fate. I mean, in, in the right. last three decades, nobody went around and said to the people on the ground, I mean, this is part of the conversation that I've, uh, we've had with the Raja, nobody knows what people want because they were never asked. You know, there's the, there's a semblance of democracy that was put together with the, the, the EPRDF coalition, but the decision was coming from the top, uh, even in terms of the represent, representation of other regions. So we really, we, we have a sense that people don't want ethnic division anymore and, and, and uh, they want a more unified Ethiopia. Um, I mean, most people are quote unquote mixed. So there's that sense but really on the ground in terms of how they want to run their lo uh, locality their schools what language they want to speak those things are not known because nobody has asked them so graham thank you so much for staying on this and thank you for giving us a perspective from the uk there's so much more that we touched on that i would love for it to have you back on uh to, to discuss in a little more detail uh but we'll see what happens tomorrow maybe we'll uh get back on later this week um if you can make the time but we really appreciate your time and analysis. Pleasure. Good luck Thank with the you. rest of the day. Thank you. Care. Good to see you. <laughs> Bye. See you soon. So uh, right before we uh, bring up Daraja, a couple of couple of updates. So uh, Karanja, I did check in with a source that said ENDF is not officially in Mekale. Now I know they've surrounded the the, the city. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's not able, the source is not able to tell me that they're actually inside the city. Um, and so for those of you who are just coming in, we are talking about the peace talks that are happening in South Africa. They were scheduled for Monday. It's about six o'clock in the evening in South Africa. So the day is over. It doesn't appear that there were any talks. Uh, but the some delegates from the TPLF have arrived, some uh Delegates from the Ethiopian government have arrived, although it may not be uh, the Ethiopian foreign minister, or uh, certainly we don't believe it's, it's it's the prime minister, but 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 some rep some representatives from the Ethiopian government um, have uh, have arrived. So I'm, I'm just taking a look at some notes. Um, yes, so we also learned that it, it is scheduled for Tuesday. So uh, nothing happened today, but it is scheduled for Tuesday, and we'll see what happens then. Uhuru Kenyatta, the former president of Kenya, who was supposed to be a part of it, um, also un unclear if he has arrived. And, and for those of you who've been watching, please make sure you are liking and sharing and subscribing. Uh, we've gotten into the habit of uh, watching without subscribing, and I haven't really been doing a lot of promotion. So this is your this is your cue. If you haven't subscribed already, to so please subscribe to this channel uh, and support independent media. Uh, we are also on eoanews.com. And so if you uh, want to contribute there to support independent media, it's easy. It's through PayPal. Um, you can use all kinds of uh, uh, platforms to do it. And then we're also on patreon.com slash Hermela TV, although I find... Um, a lot of people prefer eoanews.com, so you can go there. So with that said, I'm really uh, looking forward to the next guest that we have, Deraja Demese. He is an, an attorney by training, and so um, I have a lot of uh, questions about the legalities of this. So Deraja, welcome. Thank you, Amela. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, I'm excited to be here on this uh, day full, full of stuff and uh, great news. Interesting time. So, you know, we, so I was able to verify that document. I know you have it too, as far as who showed up. We know that Geta Chorat does uh, and the generals Arkan, we know those two, but uh, who's ambassador Wendema Asamino, Dr. Fasaha Haftation, Mr. Toad Gabret and I, Mr. Kasa, Gabri uh, Johannes, Mr. Asafa Abrahad. Are these people that are within TPLF generally? Are they, wh what, what do you know about them, if anything? I know some of the names. I have to say these are not people who are known to be prominent uh, within TPLF. And I think uh, one of them, the ambassador, you said, was described as a person who uh, basically would be assigned to different embassies as sort of a spy, is what I was told. Like, he would be like a handler for the ambassador, although he's not, um, you know, he'd be like a lower level official. But I'm, that's something I heard this morning with one of the Ethiopian uh, on the news, actually. Um, so... 
it's an indication that the brain power, so to speak, of TPLF is probably depleted to a point where they either don't have uh, people with a lot of stature or notoriety left to send, or they, for whatever reason, chose to these people. But um, again, the list, except for the top two, uh, is very uh, curious as to how it uh, was selected. And what are the legal considerations here? I mean, what could they ask for? I know, uh, you know, some people have said they're essentially negotiating the terms of their amnesty, which is possible. I mean, uh, at least seven people have left the region or uh, around seven people, we're assuming, um, left the region, maybe more. We saw numbers of nine CPLF leadership that were taken out of Tigray. Maybe they're not listed on that form that we saw. But I mean, what could they realistically or unrealistically ask for? And what is within the legal scope of the Ethiopian constitution in terms of would they be allowed after being designated a terrorist organization? Is it possible that any of them would be allowed back into the political fold? And what are the implications of that? Okay, so there may be more people who left who are not listed. So that's possible. Um, as a lawyer, when I talk about negotiation to settle a dispute, um, the first thing you do is look at what you have to offer. What is, what is it that you have to offer? What is it that you're willing to give up? What is it that you, what is your bottom line? And where do you start with the negotiation, okay? But at the end of the day, you have to show up with some cards and TPLF had a lot of cards a year ago. They had some cards left maybe three months ago. Now they're really appearing after they're told checkmate, basically. You're, you're out of cards, you're out of moves, and what are you doing negotiating? What is it that you're negotiating? All right. So the only thing is maybe sometimes, for lack of a better term, you might, what you have left is probably your temper tantrum. Maybe you're going to be disrupted, and maybe you're going to maybe what you have left is uh, uh, sort of imaginary threats uh, or imaginary promises. But then you have to do a really good job of explaining how you're going to deliver this. So you may say to your wife, for example, I'm going to, or your husband, I'm going to um, take this much or that much. And then after you divide everything, there may be some residual benefit to not calling again, right? I'm going to disappear. You won't see me ever again. That's something you can offer, right? Uh, you may offer, we're not going to instigate this or that. We're going to ask the people to go along with these um, programs, right? Um, whatever it is that they have to offer, it has to be something meaningful to the Ethiopian government, something the Ethiopian government cannot accomplish by itself. There are some variables, there are some considerations. For example, maybe they would say, we will disarm completely. We'll show you where all the hidden stuff is. We'll show you, we'll ask our uh, supporters and members to give up their arms completely. And in return, we want complete amnesty for everyone and for ourselves. Um, and these are things that they can offer, and there's some value to that. Uh, they may, uh, if assuming Mekele is not uh, taken over by the Ethiopian uh, army, uh, they may offer to facilitate that process where the city can be uh, put in, within the fold of the government without any problem. So that's still something they can, that's meaningful to the government. Um, there is this uh, continuing threat that's been made, that's being made by supporters to continue the armed struggle in some fashion, right? Uh, making sure that it's not something that is encouraged or uh, literally. We've gone through two years of carnage, right? Do we, is there any appetite to continue to bomb places and 
you know, commit, continue to do acts of violence. If you have not been successful after amassing all that army, all that weaponry and everything the country had, okay, back to, in 2020, when you start the war, you should have learned the lesson. That's not a way to go. But then you've tried a couple of times. And I think it's time for us not to talk about continued resistance and stuff like that. But what is it that can be delivered to the people that makes resistance not necessary or even appealing? So I think, can they participate constructively in that dialogue? Okay, can they participate constructively in that process? That's something they can offer. But frankly, I don't think they have it in them to do that. So, and maybe too soon for them to do that. And um, in the end, what the disarming of the, their supporters, giving up their arms, that's probably the biggest thing they can, they can offer. And regarding what you said, whether it's legal or not, there's some steps that needs to be taken, that, that needs to be taken by the Ethiopian government to um, either, either grant amnesty, revoke the TPLF status as a terrorist organization, but I don't think TPLF as a party is going to be allowed to continue, at least within Ethiopia. Um, I, I doubt that would be uh, something that is going to be on the table. Um, you know, if after all, all this, same people are allowed to go back and continue as a party, that, that's not going to work, right? Um, you're going to have personalities forming a new party and um, participating in the national dialogue and process and political process, and that that's something that can be negotiated. Um, the scope of the amnesty is a different issue. You know, you may have tiers of people, like people who have committed some serious heinous acts, um, commanders who authorized mass killings or rounding up civilians and shooting civilians, or even captured soldiers. Um, we've seen some videos. And what are you going to do with the guy who is on video shooting people, right? So. Uh, you may have a, a level, a tier of uh, punishments or retribution um, to the extent that is something the government is going to do. You can't prosecute 10,000, 100,000 people. That's not going to happen. Um, but give it, for example, after the American Civil War, where 650,000 people died, only one person was prosecuted. It was the prison uh, uh, warden at one of the most uh, Andersonville, I think Andersonville or something like that. That's the name of the prison. Um, a Confederate prison uh, ward, uh, warden who was brutal and who starved a whole bunch of uh, uh, POWs to death. And he was uh, tried and uh, hanged. So everyone else, Nothing happened to them, um, including there were, you know, atrocities committed by the Union Army too. So there was just a blanket amnesty. And in the context of the US, even the leaders were allowed to remain at large. The commanders were allowed to maintain their sidearms. And uh, I think there was some discussion whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Some people blame the lack of accountability for what happened during the Reconstruction era where Confederates regained power and started the Ku -Ku KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. And uh, some of the Jim Crow laws and uh, the lynchings that happened were related to the failure to hold people accountable for things that have happened. You so, know, that's a really interesting comparison. So it, it seems like post-war, the idea of justice looks very different. 
you know, elusive in so many ways. A lot of things that uh, the winner has to give up in order to just move forward. And so, you know, I know right now most um, Ethiopians are saying they're just essentially negotiating their terms um, of amnesty. But is there what are the things that the Ethiopian government may concede uh, that would be very uncomfortable to the Ethiopian people or the Eritrean people or the region as a whole? And what are the potential consequences of that, right? If they're brought back into the fold or even one of them is, or they're able to, the, to, to, to bring some of the, the lower rank into some sort of political fold, there may be some consequence down the line. So are we considering all the possibilities or, or are there some things that we're maybe not considering right now that that uh, will that, that, that may um, play out? So this is where you have to work backwards. You have to look at where you want to be. Where do you want to take this country a year from now? Okay. We want to have a free Tigray where people are free to select, to choose their leaders. Um, you can say you had free elections in Tigray before, but there are measures for free and fair elections. You have opposition parties, robust debate, equal airtime, and all that. So we never had that in Tigray. TPLF controlled everything, and TPLF got elected, whether it was elected um, because people wanted to elect them or not, it really doesn't matter because if you make sure there's no debate and no one is challenging you, you are going to get elected. That's, that's, that's not, you know, to say I'm democratically elected doesn't really uh, uh, make sense if there are no democratic principles embedded in the election process. So let's have a free and fair election in Tigray. Let people pick their leaders from the local level all the way up to the national, uh, to, to, to the state level, and let them uh, have the ability to replace the leaders. So we had that area has been taught to be subservient to the people who administer it. And that mentality of uh, being a subject to this one party needs to be gone and it needs to be gone forever. How can you do that if you allow the same people who put you through two, 40 years of uh, heartache and the last two years of carnage to go back and organize? Are they gonna come up with a different thought process and different ideas? They're not gonna do that. It's the same thing all over again. So I don't think you can afford to do that, right? So. The ending TPLF as a party um, may not end ideas that TPLF has instilled in certain people. You're going to have that, okay? But at least you need to create the space for robust discussion, fair uh, process of election, and the ability to renew the system by having term limits where people serve for a very short period of time, I would say a year, because you really need turnovers in, in, in these areas where you have uh, no tradition of democracy. You need three, four, five cycles, and you need to create them quickly. And if you're going to have election every five years, we're not going to do that. So we need to think about that. And as we think about that and work backwards, to look at, okay, so where is this negotiation needs to go? And the bottom line is, if you can't put the people who started the war in prison for all the atrocities they have committed, you at least have to make sure they're not going to be significant players within Ethiopia. They're not going to have any role in the process going forward because they're not going to come up with any constructive role. So you, so. You may have different personalities with the same idea, but again, that's something that you cannot, we still have neo-Nazis running around, right? So even after Hitler. So you're not gonna eradicate ideas. They're gonna be there, but you're gonna create the space for other ideas to come into the marketplace of ideas. But 
in terms of accountability, uh, this group has chosen violence over a democratic process. This group was responsible for creating the legal system in place in Ethiopia, currently in place. It wrote the constitution that is currently in place. When it said the constitution was violated, it did not go to court. It went to war. You create a system, you write laws, your own laws, and if you say the law is violated, you created a system where you can challenge that process right through the court system, take advantage of your own law. If you're not willing to do to abide by your own system, your own law, and start by violent uh, insurrection, you're not going to come back and and uh, and and uh, participate in a democratic process and expect expect it to go to court to resolve your disputes. Ultimately, this country has to resolve its disputes through the courts. So, to, to your point, um, Mr. Derege. Um, uh, if, if I may call you Derege. Derege. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so uh, to your point about um, not necessarily having punitive uh, measures taken on people, what uh, what what might amnesty look like? Do you uh, do you foresee some type of conditions, um, and how would those be? implemented and enforced. Um, and then also um, you you would hope that the Ethiopian government is going to be able to win over uh, the, the region, right? The people, the, the hearts and minds. Um, what does that look like? Okay. So um, you have to have different tiers of amnesty. You can't just have a blanket amnesty for everyone. There are people who are conscripted to 12 year olds, 13 year olds, 15 year olds who were taken from their parents and sent to fight. And they might have been involved in some atrocities. They might have burned houses. They might have been told to go and, uh, you know, steal this and that. Um, so you're going to look at the age of those people. You're going to look at how they joined and all that. And um, even if they've done some horrible things, you may send them to a place where they get some type of education and have a discussion and reform and all that and, and let them reintegrate them in, in society. Then you're going to have the commanders who were shooting the 13 and 14 year old kids who have never been in a war situation and the first time they, something explodes next to them, they're going to run. So they run, and they are they are machine gunning these kids as they are running away, because every kid would do that, right? So what are you going to do to those people? Um, you're going to have these people come and confess their crime openly, be accountable to the parents of those kids, right? You're going to have that national dialogue and process, and at the end of that process, based on the culpability, the level of uh, crime they've committed, there has to be some type of accountability and retribution, some, right? There are people who rounded up and, and shot several people. And by the way, you there are claims that um, some Ethiopian soldiers have committed atrocities. You have to address that as well. And um, if there are people identified for committing sexual assault, for example, you got You have to address that. The Ethiopian government actually has charged a, a number of uh, soldiers, by the way. I know at least over 30 uh, who are charged. But it's both ways. It's you have the healing process cannot be like, okay, you're the only person this who's done that. We're gonna, you know, this is not Victor's court. This is a national healing. Things have happened in Afar. Things have happened in Amhara region. Things have happened in Tigray. And all of those need to be addressed. There has to be a discussion between the people. The best way to move forward is to have perpetrators face the victims and hear from the victims as to how they felt. Right? It's not an easy thing, but it has to be done. 
people need to face what they've done, the consequences of their actions, what it meant for a father or mother to lose a child, right? And, uh, or for a woman to be uh, violated. And you have to have, you have, you have to create that process. It's going to be messy, it's going to be long, it's going to be difficult, but there has to be a dialogue between people. You can't have uh, these types of process in a nice court with a judge. It's, it's, it's not gonna happen. Then, you know, for the higher people, yes. The last, the second question you asked was, if you can just uh, refresh me, because I thought it was interesting at the time you said, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I kind of feel like you, you've the sort hearts of addressed and it. The hearts and mind of the people. You're right. Can the government win the hearts and mind? And I can tell you this, the best way to win the hearts and mind of people is to listen to the people. You have to listen to the people and you have to create the conditions for the people to empower themselves and administer themselves in a way they want to administer themselves. So... If the government imposes its will on the people, it's not going to work. And if you allow the same elites to come in and pick the leaders for the, it's not going to work. You can't have ethnic leaders. We've been, we got to this place where we are today because of not more than 10 ethnic leaders. I'm not kidding. I can identify four or five people who created the Oromo Liberation Front. Four or five people who created the Tigran Liberation Front. Four or five people who created even the Eritrean Liberation. So the, the, the ethnic leaders who know the best for millions of people cannot be the ones who are going to go to Tigray and pick the leaders and create a party and administer that area. You have to bifurcate. You have to have a true federal system. The local people pick their own leaders. Forget the party. Let them pick their own leaders. You don't have to be a member of an organized party. Do you pick, think that is something that would happen immediately, Deraja, though? Or, or, or is there like a period of, you know, just rehabilitation and just making sure they get their basic needs met? I mean, my, my concern is that if you gave the people that option to, to choose again, they're choosing based on fear maybe this isn't true but they're they're traumatized they really don't know i mean these are largely a lot of people who've been in a bubble so they have a certain set of facts or perceptions and i mean would they what what would that look like i mean i i'm, I'm just really curious do you, so, do you think they'd be capable so, of, of choosing non-ethnic leaders so you take an area, uh, let's say uh, a town of uh, 500 people, and you ask, right now, there's a huge vacuum. There's no administration, there's no, you know, there's no structure. So you have the Ethiopian army controlling several areas, and they're trying to facilitate uh, aid and different things, but you have to have a group of people that you interface with kind of representatives of the people. So the point is to encourage people who have not been involved in TPLF in one way or the other, uh, elder people, women, allow them to come in and create sort of a, a, a system where they represent the interest of that area and interface with the people. You have to create a new um, group of people who are empowered to act on behalf of their area. And maybe in, in my ideal world, you would have these new people every year. You would have a new new set of people elected. It could be you have to have a term. Day. So you serve for a year and you're out, kind of thing or you serve for a year, you may get another year, and then you're done after two terms. Because uh, entrenched interest, where you get used to 
power and then you create your own pyramid system where you bring in three or four people under you who also dole out favors to three or four people under them. They control the whole supply of aid or education opportunities and business opportunities and all that. And then the rest of the people will be subservient to them for all their needs and will be told what they do. That needs to be broken. It's really I, about I empowering people. I can't help thinking that this kind of is, is bleeding over from the previous discussion about um, you know what what a new sort of um, democratic uh, representative uh, system looks like i i've personally advocated strongly for the uh, for a return to something akin to the old um, system of uh, councils of elders um, that was obviously unelected these were people that were put placed in in positions of power because of merit because of age, wisdom, but also taking a, a look at their whole sort of in totality, the, the way they have lived their lives within that community and being people of integrity. And that worked uh, in, 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 in traditional, but also tribal African communities. And, I, and, and I've often advocated that we can replicate something similar on the national stage to have like some type of an executive leadership council derived from the different regions and the different communities. Um, so uh, that, model, that model can work, for example, you know, in any federal system, you have the executive branch and then you have the legislative branch. So the elder thing works in terms of the legislative aspect. Of it. But then you have to have people who work nine to five, right? They need to be in the office uh, addressing different concerns of people. You have to run education. You have to have healthcare. You have to have expertise. You have to have people who know what they're doing. So you can't always rely on uh, a council of elders, but you can have a council of elders who set the priorities of the area what they want, how to, to, to promote their culture, their, their religion, their tradition. And you, I think that can be something that can be replicated, but the day-to-day -day operation of a government right, needs the bureaucracy. And you have to have that bureaucracy um, managed by people who are elected. So how do you, uh, and, 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 and replaced. So, that you have you can you can marry those principles and um, with the principles of federalism and democracy and come up with a well, hybrid system well why not have a, a sort of replicate that system but move it into modern day and have that executive leadership council be you know a professional elected uh, body that you know is tasked with doing all the things that are legis that not that modern legislatures uh, are tasked with and and bureaucracies yeah but ultimately you have to again this has to come from the people right there the, the, there's the tendency to go in and say yeah we have a nice cute system for you this is how you want to you're gonna you're gonna do things from now on they're not they're, they're not used to that so it's going to be uh it has to grow out of organically out of the the, the tradition of the people maybe again the biggest thing the government can do is listen and to listen to the people and empower them to um, come up with a, a way to uh, govern themselves but also uh, engage in dialogue of creating a collective dream. You have to have a collective dream if you're going to have a country. You can't have 10 different dreams in 10 different regions that are in constant conflict with one another. And we have a constitution in Ethiopia that's designed to keep the country in constant tension. So it's because when it was drafted, it was not drafted from the collective dream of the people. It was drafted by, you are Oromo, you're going to have one dream, you are Tigray, you're going to have a different dream, you have Somali, you have a different dream, and your dreams don't cross each other. And in fact, that dream is dangerous to you, and this dream is dangerous. It's like, this is uh, the craziest legal system we have. So now, 
was TPLF out of the conversation, at least for now, um, or at least out of power, there is the airspace to engage in a very constructive discussion of what our collective dream is. How do we make that a reality? Let's think about 300 years from now, not 50 years, not 20 years, not tomorrow. 300 years from now, how can we make sure our, the children of our children of our children can never fight and can resolve their problems and live in peace and harmony? So um, we are now, it's not a breaking point, but we're at an inflection point. We have turned the corner and we can start uh, somewhat fresh, although there's so many residual problems we have to be dealing with. But this is a point where we can really, if we um, take the initiative and maximize the opportunities and the chances that we have, we can do something great. We can do something very uh, constructive. And I think the agenda of uh, Abi Ahmed, uh, Prime Minister Abi Ahmed, is a development agenda. He didn't come to office saying we're going to start war, right? <laughs> He's, that's not, that was not his uh, agenda. So now he can get he can go back to the original agenda, and that original agenda is now going to happen if you do not have a collective. You have to create that. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, a couple what, of what, things that I just so there, you know there is this sense that TPLF is out of power in a sense, um, and then you've talked about. Um, listening to the people and asking questions about what they want and relating to both of those things. I think this is a question that's going to come up over and over again and, and maybe more most pressing now. The username Neptunister says, how could you listen to the people right now, I'm assuming he's saying right now, when TPLF has such a deep five decade long grip on every aspect of society you might be listening to tplf again and again and again what do you say to that yeah so um tplf has fed a lot of lies to people right and when you engage in conversation when i say listen to the people there's an active listening and you're just not sitting down and say oh, okay what do you want we want tplf back okay let's bring tplf that's not what i mean but we need to engage in conversation as to what happened, where we are, where do you want to go? And you have to engage and frame the discussion in a way that directs people's mind to how do we live in peace and harmony with your neighbors? How do you, how do you envision that? How do you, uh, what type of, uh, by the way, most people worry about how to they feed their children what kind of education the children are going to get, what kind of opportunities the children are going to have. Most parents, that's what they think about. They're not sitting at home and thinking, well, I want to uh, uh, start a war or I want to uh, secede from uh, Ethiopia. And that's not the, that's not the everyday um, problem people face. That's, not, that's the political, the ethnic leaders, the liberators. Um, that's probably what they think about. But the regular people, they are trying to have a, a decent life, basically. So how do you wanna live? What are the opportunities you want to give to your children? Um, these are the questions. How do you, in this area, what do you need? What are your needs in this area to develop, to um, do better farming, to have more, uh, uh, investment, to have uh, schools, to have water and electricity. These are the things you're going to engage in people and how do we achieve that? Um, the discussion about uh, whether or not there's going to be TPLF, or it's going to be secession, or it's going to be armed struggle, resistance, that's a ridiculous discussion. No one's going to engage in that. We're done. That's, that's over. Um, that's that conversation probably uh, 50 years too late. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's a tired conversation. Um, at, at this point, going forward means um, opportunities, development, peace, and democratic rights, equality, freedom, 
these are the things you want to discuss. Things that are meaningless to people. What sort of rights would you like to have? Um, how do you want to exercise that? Um, so that's that's what I well, that's what I meant when uh, when I meant listen. You, Hermela, earlier you were discussing about how do we know what people want? Because there are all these ethnic leaders who tell us what people want. And you may be a Tigran and they say to you, Tigrans want this and that. And you say, well, I'm a Tigran. I don't want that. Well, you're not a good Tigran. You're not a Tigran. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's really amazing, yeah. <laughs> so they, they know, uh, they know, what you want, they know what is best for you, and they know you don't know what is best for you, so they're gonna make that decision for you also. So we, we're, we're done with those people. And and we need to do uh, public opinion polls in, in Ethiopia. We need to know what people think about different things. I think that next thing the government should really encourage is these universities that have math department and they have students who learn statistics. They should go out and do public opinion polls. Let, let us ask people what they want. What are their priorities in different areas? And um, that's part of the listening uh, I'm talking about. So once people know that, maybe the politicians can be informed by the opinion of the people as opposed to telling people what they want. So you're not saying, you know, going to people and saying, you know, do you do you still want Deborah Young to be your leader? Do you want TPLO? You know, like that's I think that's what people read and then yeah. think, are these yeah. people going to be able to make a different decision? So it's more about what How are you going to in your life? What needs are not being met? How do you think they can be met? Yes. What do you want in life? How do you want to live? What What are your dreams for your children? And how do you think you can improve your area? Uh, these are the things people need to have a different dream than dying. <laughs> we've, we've done the dying part for the past you know, several years. And right now, let's not talk about destruction and death. We're gonna talk about how to rebuild, not only uh, the areas, but the mind, how to rebuild our, um, relationship, connection with our neighbors, and how to rebuild uh, maybe even our souls. So let's let's have a deeper discussion, encourage people to engage with one another. Let's bring Amharas from the areas that were affected, bus them to different parts of Tigray, and have collective meetings. Let the people talk to one another and do the same thing. And so to, uh, yeah, to that to that point, um, as as we get ready to wind down, um, you you've raised the question of, um, uh, and you just brought it up again. Amharas, um, you know, there's, there's as you pointed out, there's probably inevitably in war there's going to be atrocities um, in all from all kinds of directions and in all kinds of areas. Um, and and not 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 to be too pessimistic but uh so with the tplf out of the way um what what then happens there's the ola for example you 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 raised that question earlier um and then you know there's there's these movements that have emerged as a result of the divisions that have taken place um and it's a it's a it's a double barrel question um sort of, although they might be two, two separate questions. So I, I hope you'll be able to treat them both. The other one is, you know, some of the TPLF leadership will be going overseas. How do we prevent them sort of going to foment uh, some type of ongoing uh, rebellion or uh, opposition from, from abroad, wherever it is that they go? Because inevitably some of them will go. I mean, there's some already in South Africa that might not return. Yeah, so you're not going to be able to control what they do once they leave. And let's say they're in Canada or wherever they go. Um, they are going, they're, they're former TPLF leaders uh, in different places right now. So I, I don't think uh, they will be that effective outside to so long as you uh, allow 
the people in Tigray to live in a way they want to live, right? So you have to remove the reasons for people to rebel, right? So one major reason why this war happened is because TPLF was there and they were able to organize and mobilize and instigate that. You've removed that. So the next thing is you need to make sure that another TPLF is not is not going to fill the space. The um, lack of arms is going to be significant. If you collect all the arms in that area and you make sure that people are not armed to the teeth, that's you know that's that's going to be important. The other thing is now uh, with TPLF out of the way, you have the opportunity to deal with OLA. There are ways to deal with them peacefully. That should be tried. If not, then there's a way to deal with them through um, military operation. So I don't see them as a major threat, um, but um, because I'll tell you this, if the Oromo people supported OLA, OLA would be taking over the country. It's not, they don't have support. There, there are very few supporters who are very vocal. And um, they, they're, not, um, they're not going to be a major problem in my mind. They, uh, I think they will themselves, uh, I think, come into the fold. They will probably do some type of negotiation too. Uh, because if you really ask, what is it that the Oromo Liberation, the, whatever, the OLA army wants to, uh, wants to achieve, that's not already achieved in Ethiopia. What is it? You know, there isn't much they can say. Uh, in the old days, they would say, Oromos need to speak their language, and Oromos need to, uh, to, to have respect for their culture and all that. It's done. Uh, they really don't have a lot of... Uh, thing a lot of they don't have much to offer to the people which is why they're not they're not enjoying uh, popular support so i don't think that they're going to be a major player but i think this will give the government an opportunity to deal with them uh, as they would deal with uh, uh, the gumus and other people that uh, liberation uh, front uh, the other major uh, aspect is the countries that used to support them, if you look at the Oromo Liberation Army's websites, they're all, most of them originate from Egypt. And they're supported by governments outside of Ethiopia. Sudan supported some, some Egypt supports them. Those two countries have also run out of cards. They've 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 uh, bank, they banked on TPLF to take power and make concessions to them. That's not there anymore. So they've realized about three weeks ago that's the case. So they both changed their tune. Egypt said they're going to try a different approach from supporting violence and instigating war. Uh, Sudan is also changed the tune and said we're not going to do anything that jeopardizes Ethiopia's integrity and all that. So without that kind of support, which is going to dry up, and everyone's going to come play with the Ethiopian government. America is going to come and uh, be a very supportive, uh, play a very supportive role. Uh, European Union will change its tune and be a very support, play a supportive role. Egypt will uh, try a different way to negotiate, Sudan the same way. And I think without TPLF, there's going to be uh, an opportunity for a renewed engagement with all these uh, players and less of an opportunity for fringe elements like OLA and you know, uh, other so-called liberation armies to continue to uh, uh, wreak havoc in, in the country. Great. 
Great. Yeah. As we're wrapping up, I just want to summarize a few points that I think are interesting that, you know, I want people to hear a second time that you mentioned, Dereja, is that, you know, when it comes to moving forward in Tigray, the thing to do or one of the things that will have to be done is ask the people what they want. And it's not about whether they want TPLF or no TPLF. TPLF is not going to be a part of the equation for a slew of reasons, but more about how do they want to live? What do they need? What do they think they need to get there? Um, you know, what do they want for their kids? Probably questions that much of this generation has not ever been asked, especially in in, in parts, uh, in, in rural parts like Tigray that are uh, relatively impoverished compared to the cities. And then, you know, the thing that you said that also struck me is perpetrators actually having to face their victims. I don't know if there's precedent for that in Ethiopian history, at least modern Ethiopian history, but that just, you know, almost gave me chills to think about you know, these people, whether because they wanted to or were forced to, you know, shot and killed a lot of people as part of this war, whether it was because, uh, you know, people and children on their side that were retreating from the war front or for whatever other political reasons, them actually facing the parents of maybe the children that they've killed. I mean, that whole concept is so, so interesting uh but also chilling and then uh you also mentioned possibly you know busing people whether it's amharas to tigray tigrayans to the amhara region to ha be able to foster a conversation because in many ways uh the people that they're told are their enemy on both sides are people they don't even know you know they they haven't lived near or have ever really seen in person uh, because they're over there in another region. So I think that also sounds like a really interesting, tangible way uh, to deal with some of these issues of isolation and separation. So, um, you know, Tuesday, the, the, the talks continue. It doesn't sound like much happened today. So we'll see if anything comes out of it. Uh, we did see a list of names, seven names uh, from the TPLF side uh, that were that are in South Africa uh, and uh, some folks from the Ethiopian um, government that were sent down there. So we'll see what happens tomorrow. Naraja, thank you so much for your insight as like always. Me, one last thing before I go. Please, go ahead. So the, last, the history of the last 60 years of Ethiopia has been marked by so-called liberation fronts. Liberation fronts who, may, who, who put the country through a series of war and conflict. The liberation war, liberation fronts operate in one distinct philosophy that there's a distinct uh, oppressor, they are the oppressed, and they are the liberators. We need to move away from that mentality. And I think we have now an opportunity to say there's no one oppressor in Ethiopia, there is no one single oppressor. And whoever that is, is dead, okay? We are, we, we are in a different space. There is no, you know, there are a lot of uh, things that happened, but there is no one group that's oppressed. There is no one group that was oppressed or uh, an oppressor. And you are not a liberator, okay? The people need to say what they want. Stop acting you are a representative of a whole bunch of people. Speak for yourself. You do not speak for this group or that group. You are not a leader. There is no such thing as a leader of an ethnic group. So let's have everyone speak for themselves. Let the people decide. And let's have true democracy, equality, and individual freedom. And, and let's see if we can have a system that works for everyone. That's a conversation I would like to have. Next chapter. Yeah, we can't keep saying TPLF, right? After this chapter, it will have to be a different kind of conversation that empowers individuals and separates this idea that one ethnic group has, you know, a monopoly on, on thought and perspective. So that's uh, that sounds like it's the next chapter. Karanja, anything else you want to say before we let Dereja go? Sure. You know, listening to Dereja talking about that, um, you know, it, it's not so visible in Kenya, but you know, th there's there's remnants, not even remnants. There's sort of bubbling up those similar narratives about sort of this, uh, I would say, invisible oppressor, 
and these politicians who sort of want to portray themselves as, as the liberators. And even though it's not visible, there's undercurrents of that. And of course, the foundation of that is ethnic federalism, which I'm not even going to ask any questions uh, about that because that will be a whole <laughs> new show. But, um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I'd love to have that conversation at some point about how a new Ethiopia emerges without ethnic federalism and by extension, because I want those answers for my country too, because the, the new system, the new devolved system we have in Kenya really is, is a system that where the country is divided along ethnic lines. And I can see how those divisions can bubble up to similar um, um, issues. And this happened in Ethiopia 30 years ago. It's happened in Kenya over the last 10 years with the new constitution. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I keep raising the, ringing the bell, the, the alarm bells uh, to stray away from that. Uh, thank you so much. It's been uh, an enriching and um, educative uh, session and um, look forward to another one. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Hamela. Thank, Thank you, you. Anna. See you soon. Thank you, Thank you. Karanja. Hold on. Okay, I know we got four minutes because you have a Twitter space. So I'll do a quick recap, and then I want you to talk about your Twitter space. We're all going to go over there. Um, so we were talking about the peace talks that are happening in South Africa. They were scheduled for Monday, so it's the end of the day Monday in South Africa. Nothing seemed to have happened, but we do know the representatives from the TPLF, seven people, top ones being Generals Arkan and Gita Choreta that are going there, possibly eight, because it looks like De Razion, uh, President uh, De Razion is the one who signed it. Um, and uh, some representatives from Ethiopia have been sent as well. We're not sure if Uhuru Kenyatta, who's a peace envoy in this, um, is there. Uh, we'll find out tomorrow, which is when the peace talks are actually scheduled to happen. Um, and uh, we have also gotten some word that maybe some of the leadership will not return back to Tigray and they may get some amnesty in Canada, all really to be confirmed. As far as we know, uh, ENDF is not in Megale yet, at least not that I can confirm, uh, but they are surrounding that uh, city. So it, it, it's soon. I've been told it is soon that they're going to be into Megale. So Karanda, thank you so much for doing these uh, these interviews with me. We talked to attorney Daraja Demise. We talked to writer um, uh, Grant Peebles, who's based in the UK and writes about Ethiopia. Uh, tell the people where we're going next because uh, you've got some stuff to do or you've got a Twitter space happening. Yes, yeah, so we are going over to our Twitter space and for once it's actually not a political space. Um, we, we started it, it <laughs> I know, surprise, right? It, start, it did start out as a political space around uh, affordable housing and social housing that has now evolved into a space where we talk about um, construction and housing in general, including private affordable housing, but, but private. So that's the space that we are uh, going into that I co-host with the, the Arts in the Heart um, um, is that who's the, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll go look at, everybody go to Karanja San, because is that where you're logging in as? Yes. Um, okay. So, yes, I, I'll be logged in as Karanja. Well, actually, uh, the Brief Scoop. Uh, sorry, Brief okay. Scoop. Brief Scoop. Okay. We're all going over to Brief Scoop at B-R-I-E-F-S-C-O-O-P. That's a Twitter handle. Um, and have this conversation about housing, which I have not been a part of. So that should be interesting. Um, different conversation um, all together. Thank you so much for your time, Karanja. You're a great co-host. Thank you. This was great. Thank you so much for it having me. really good. I'll see you on Twitter space. Take care. Thank you so much, everybody. Make sure you like, you share, you subscribe, um, and, and, and share with all the group chats that I know all of you have about the Horn of Africa and Africa as a whole, all these different developments that are happening. Uh, we may come back on, or I may come back, back on with some folks tomorrow to talk about what happens um, overnight, our time in the U.S., but uh, Tuesday in South Africa. So stay tuned. Thank you. See you guys later. Thank you. you Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.